on the screen for me, is the two missions. The two missions. You'll see some pictures there of a guy breaking into a car and a guy with a gun and a guy choking a, I think that's his wife. I don't know, I think that's a David Diamond picture. And then on the other side you have life and you have a spiritual life is life with God. And um, Some of the things that I'll be sharing with you are taken from the pulpit commentary, which is a very famous commentary that's been around for years and years and years. And, but most of what I want to be sharing is what God put upon my heart this morning. Around 4 a.m. I was up, I was in my bed, and I was just tossing some thoughts around, and I felt like God was showing me some things. My text this morning is taken from John chapter 10, verse 10. If you will turn with me, please, to the Gospel of John chapter 10, verse 10. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, you can change that background for me. That was last week's message, the cornerstone. There we go. That's good. Thank you. Gospel of John, chapter 10, starting with verse 10. Is everybody there? Yes. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I want to give you a little background on this particular verse of Scripture, because Jesus here is speaking, and sometimes we don't understand who he's talking to. Sometimes we take it out of context. We don't seemingly think that he is speaking to a particular a group of people, but he is. If you read in chapter 9 and you start reading back there, you'll see about the miracle of the blind man being healed and, and the Pharisees and the Jews making uh, excuses for Jesus and saying that he's not of God and his works are not of God and that uh, if he was a man of God, he wouldn't be a sinner because he broke the Sabbath. So we see that he's speaking to the Pharisees and he's, he's talking to them and he's letting them know in verse 1, he says, Verily I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door of the shepherd, of the sheepfold rather, but climbing up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And what he's saying is there are those who are trying to get to God on their own terms, on their own way. The Pharisees were religious people. I don't know if you saw the latest uh, news feed of Kenneth Copeland now combining with the uh, Pope in some areas. Uh, some of these men I've been warning you about for years and years, and people have ridiculed me and mocked me for it, but some of these men are starting to turn the church back to Rome. Hello. And I always say a little time will tell. And so I have nowhere to go but to be patient and wait. I'm only, as some person once said, uh, I was at the pastor's, pastor's meeting and there was a bunch of pastors there. Some are more successful, and if you look at success as numbers, than I am. And I made a statement, and it was overlooked except for a couple. And the, one of the pastors turned to me and said, Pastor Bob, that is wisdom. He said, speak it out. And I spoke the words, I'm only a voice crying in the wilderness. Because I'm not out to be popular. I'm not out to be famous. I'm not out to be heard by everyone. But I'm here to be heard by the ones that have ears to hear what the Spirit of God has to say. I'm not here to waste my time. I'm not here to play church. I'm here to give you the unadulterated word of God and to the best of my ability, impart something to you that will keep you in these last days that we're living in. 
First of all, he says in verse 10, now keep in mind the title of my message, The Two Missions. Number one, we have the mission of the thief. The Bible says, The thief cometh not but for to steal. I'm going to stop there for a moment. And this morning as I was in, in bed, laying in bed, just tossing and uh, putting these thoughts through my mind, I believe the Lord began to speak to me about different ways the devil, if we can take this portion of scripture and apply it to him because he is the thief, he's the one that kills, he's the one that destroys. And the Lord began to speak to me that there are some people that don't even realize that the devil, who is a thief, is robbing from them. And the Lord began to speak to me, and I said, Lord, I said, Lord, show me how the people are being deceived and how the devil is robbing them. And one of the things that the devil has allowed to come to pass, or, or what we have allowed in our life, comes under the heading of the word entertainment. We have so much time to do everything and anything. We have time to sit and watch a two and a half hour movie. We have time to go on the computer, to spend hours in front of Facebook. But yet I hear this so often when I talk to Christians, I don't have enough time to pray. I don't have enough time to read my Bible. And they're not realizing that the enemy, the thief, has come to rob, to steal something that is far more valuable to your precious life than just the things that are in this life. And I begin to think about that and I said, Lord, how true it is. That we can watch four or five hours of television a day, but we can't read your word. We can't stay awake to read your word. Why? Because there's, a, there's an enemy who is out to destroy you, to kill your spirituality, to take away from you all that God wants to impart to you to get you ready for heaven. Because the earth that you live on is not your home. The Bible says that we're only pilgrims passing through. We're only going through this life. But there is a life that is eternal. There is a life that is far more exceedingly beneficial to you and to me. And I started to say, Lord, how there are deficient areas in my life. Lord, how I have wasted more time doing certain things that are okay to do, but not needful. And when you realize that there is someone called a thief who is stealing from you, let me ask you this question. Have you ever gotten something that you own stolen from you? Have you ever expected something to be there and gone into your home and found out that someone had violated your, your very protection of your home and gone into that place and taken something that didn't belong to them? How you felt violated. How you felt angry. How you felt that, well, how could somebody do this? Let me tell you, you know, we, in, the, in the days that we live in, if you look on television, you can't hardly see a commercial that doesn't have an effect upon your security. They have LifeLock now to protect you from theft, identity theft. But can I tell you something? There's someone far greater than just a natural person who is robbing you of your identity. There is a spiritual being called Satan, and he's robbing you of your your, your identity in Christ. He's trying to rob you of everything that God has intended for you. 
And the sad part about it is you and I are allowing him to do it. And we have all kinds of excuses. But when we stand before the high court of God, those excuses will mean nothing. God always spoke to me and told me, don't tell me you don't have enough time. Because you're insulting my omnipotence. When we say we don't have enough time, we're saying that God made a mistake when he made 24 hours. God made 24 hours. I think he knew how much time we'd need. The problem, number one, is not God. The problem is our time management. You can always point the finger at self, never at God. It's never God's fault. It's always our fault. We'll spend hours and hours doing our own entertainment and our own things that we like to do. Bless you. And we'll have no problem and we'll sit there and we'll do these things and, and perform these things for hours, reading a computer screen or doing whatever. But yet when we grab the Bible, we're tired. You ever read in the scriptures there's a spirit of slumber? Let me tell you, the enemy knows exactly the weapons to use against you and I. The thief comes to steal. What are some of the other ways that he steals from us? He steals our integrity. He lies to us and tells us, be dishonest. No one's going to find out. Cheat on your taxes. Say this and say that when in that reality it's not. No one's going to know. Well. Because it doesn't matter what people perceive of you from the outward appearance. Because you have to live with you every single day of your life. I have to live with me every single day of my life. And so what happens is, is that, you know, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool God any time. Because God knows everything. And so the devil comes and says, it's okay to lie, to cheat, to steal. It's okay to do things underhanded. It's okay to, to, to bend the truth a little bit. And what ends up happening is your integrity and your character begins to be flawed. Maybe people will not see that, but you see that. And when you see that, that gives the enemy, Satan, to come in and bring guilt and condemnation. Uh, what, do I, what do I mean, Pastor? Well, how many times you knew that was... There was something that you should have done. Something maybe you should have prayed. And you didn't pray when God was birthing something in you to go pray or do something. How you felt guilty after. How you felt, I should have done that. But you ended up not doing it. When we stand before the bema seat of Christ... To be rewarded for what we have done in this life. What are you going to present to God? Well, God, I worked 60 hours a week. Wonderful. What's the spiritual benefit of that? I worked three jobs, Lord, and yet I sacrificed by not seeing my family grow up. What good is that? I went out and got my PhD. What good is that? If it doesn't benefit anyone but yourself. It's not good. What are you going to give to 
Jesus, when you stand there, and he, and he says, what have you done? Well, Lord, I mastered ping pong. I mastered basketball. There are some people's ambitions in the world to sit in every NFL football stadium in America. That's their ambition, to go to every single game that they can, one game at every single stadium. What good is that? Yet the thief, we don't recognize, comes to, to rob you. What would happen if a thief left you a calling card? And said, I'm going to the Abruz house, 7.30, Thursday night, and put it in your mailbox, I'm going to come and rob you. What would you do? Would you go out? You'd be ready for him. You'd call the police, you'd have, you'd have the detectives there, and hiding in the, in the rooms, waiting for him to come. But the problem here is, is that you have an invisible enemy. And he doesn't announce when he's going to come. And he doesn't announce the ways in which he comes. I mean, you know, some of the thieves are so stupid. If, if you ever watched the, uh, on television that uh, program about the thieves that are so stupid, you know. They try to crawl into a hole this big and they get stuck. Or they, they, they go into a bank to rob the bank and then they run into the, in between the two doors and what happens is the doors lock and, they, and it's a bulletproof glass, they can't break the glass and they get stuck in the middle. See, the devil robs us and we're not even paying attention. See, because he does it little by little. He's a thief. He does it little by little. And how he does it is by changing your ideology and your philosophy. Do you know there's intellectual demons? Go to any university, you'll find a bunch of them there. Those are the, some of the hottest people to win the Christ because they, their intellect is their God. Had a good friend and in, in, in good minister friend of mine Asked me one day, do you know what the word PhD stands for? I said, no. He said, piled high and deep. What good does it mean to accumulate? Jesus said, do not stir up for yourself treasures here on earth, where moth and rust can corrupt it, but stir up treasures in heaven that you may have your reward. You know, I, I sit and I watch these do-it-yourself programs and these home improvement programs, and I watch people sink sometimes thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars into a kitchen. And then I turn the channel. I see a little boy with no clothes, no shoes. Hasn't eaten two weeks. What do you think that's going to do to when Jesus, that person stands before Jesus? And what we do is we turn the channel fast. Oh, but let a little dog get run over or thrown out of a car. And we'll give the $20 a month for some stupid animal that we value more. There was a, 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 a survey given. And they asked people, if you had your favorite pet that you loved, and your pet was drowning, 
and a stranger was drowning, who would you save? 80% said they would save their pet. No value of life. They would save their pet over a human being. The thief comes not but for to steal. And what you and I need to do is we need to get angry. We need to start getting mad at the devil. When he comes with his, his suggestions. And can I say this? Sometimes, you know, we think it's us talking because we hear our voice. Do you know the devil is a great masquerade? He's transformed to an angel of light. He could be transformed and he's a good mimicker. You say, how do you know that, pastor? Because you go to any seance, you see a woman that is in a trance speak just like your grandmother. Same grandmother's voice, same uncle's voice, same father's voice, same voice. To convince you that's your grandfather or your grandmother or whoever. It's a demon. In the same way, he can speak to your mind thinking that it's your voice. And say, you don't have to do that. You don't have to read. You don't have to pray. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to tithe. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. After all, you're your own person. When I, hear, when I hear that speaking to me in my voice, I go, wait a minute. What is that voice trying to do? Is it trying to bring me closer to Jesus or is it trying to bring me more further away from Jesus? Is it, is it using reason in my mind to bring me to a place of disobedience? There's two missions. This first mission of the enemy is to cause you to be disobedient. To put things secondary and put self first. To put the church secondary and put self first. To put Jesus secondary and put self first. Self-interest. I believe 99.8% of the Christians today would not survive the New Testament church in the book of Acts. If the apostles came to you and said, sell everything you've got so we can have all things common. Oh, well, wait a minute. We'd start puffing up our chests. Why, should I share with this lazy fisherman over here? When I worked 30 years over here, acquired all my wealth, and you want me to sell everything so we can have everything common? The thief comes to steal. Don't worry, I'm not asking for an offering. I'm not asking you to sell your home and have everything put in the same pot. The thief comes not but to steal. To rob from you, your spirituality, your relationship with God. He'll even use people. He'll use your daughter, your son, your cousins, your uncles, your aunties, your mommy, your daddy, your teachers. Oh, I can't go to church today. My son has a toenail, in, ingrown toenail. He's in hurt and I've got to take care of him. It's not important. Got to take care of his toenail. How old is he? 40 years old. The devil comes to rob. Do you, when you hear this, does it violate you? Does it get you thinking, 
wait a minute. The devil is robbing me. We sang that, that song, Lord, I will follow. When you call me, I will answer. When are you going to answer? When are you going to prepare to be able to be used by God to do what God has called you to do? Next year? You don't have next year, maybe. When are you going to use the gift that God has placed inside of you? Next month? Next 10 years? 5 years? When you're tired of doing what you're doing now? Yet you can walk around, oh, I'm called of God. I got a call of God. Do you? What are you doing with it? Wasting your time. My prayer is God burn the internet from those who are addicted to it. Two, three hours, four hours on the internet. Five minutes in prayer. Four or five hours Facebook. Ten minutes reading the Bible. What's important to you will reflect in your life. What is important to you will reflect in your life. And what you do. People are not going to listen to you. They're going to watch you. And when they watch you, they're going to see what is important to you by your actions. Hello? The thief cometh not but for to steal. How does he do that? Let's look at the television for a moment. There is more filth and garbage on television. Hello? There's nudity. Sexual exploitation of women. Are you allowing that in your home? Is it part of the package? I don't want the package. Hello? Are you subscribing to things you shouldn't be subscribing to? Some Playboy, Penthouse, X-rated things? Very easy today. All you have to do is turn to the channel, order it, pay it. And nobody knows it but you. Oh, and God. Why do you allow the devil to rob you? Some people say, you know what, Pastor, you're brainwashed. I say, thank God I am. My brain's washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. You know, actually, the people that are in the world are brainwashed. If you turn to Revelation, and I believe it's the 19th chapter, somewhere around there, it says, the whole world lieth in the deception of the evil one. The number one weapon that Satan uses and the thief uses is deception. And they look at us Christians and say, we're brainwashed. But it's the other way around. They're deceived. And the problem with that is this. In the end times, when the Antichrist comes, the Bible says that God, now listen now, God will send a strong delusion that they 
who are unsaved should believe a lie. And the reason why is because they love not the way of salvation. Do you understand me? That delusion there's no freedom from. You won't be free from it. You will take the mark of the beast. And you can know everything you want to say you know now. But if you're not a committed Christian, if you're not committed to Christ, you will be deceived and you will take the mark. Hello? He's going to be a singer. The thief cometh not but to, to, to rob you. And then the second thing he does is he kills. He kills. Oh, you don't think he kills? Look around you. Ten-year-olds going to school with a gun and blowing their classmates away. People taking drugs and, and, and overdosing. I think there's over a hundred overdoses of heroin in New Bedford since January. Hello. Do we care? Are we at the altar praying and weeping for the unsaved? No. We're too busy. Too busy with ourselves. Too busy to come Monday night prayer. Can't be bothered. Got better things to do. I'm not trying to throw a guilt trip on you. If you're guilty, maybe you're, maybe you're guilty. Everything's more important than God. Can't come to prayer, but hey, if we could go fishing at 4 o'clock in the morning... Or we can go to Disney World and we can get up for, to catch a plane at 4 o'clock in the morning. Yes, sirree, baby, we're up at 2 o'clock making sure all the bags are packed and we're in the car and off we go. He'll rob us. And he'll kill your desire. Listen to me. He will kill your desire for God. He doesn't just come and blow you away. He doesn't just come in with a shotgun and blow you away with one shot. But he uses the bullets of deception. He'll use the bullets of mediocrity. He'll give you the bullets of excuses. And he'll keep firing them at you, and firing them at you, and firing at you, and firing them at you. There's always tomorrow. There's another bullet. You can do it later. There's another bullet. You don't have to be that committed. There's another bullet. And we allow ourselves to get wounded. And we allow those wounds in our spirit to continue to manifest in our life that's when the devil comes in and says, well, why are you serving this God anyway? You're always going through trouble. You're always going through financial difficulty. You're always going through something. Why are you serving God? Allowing, he's allowing all this to go on you. You might as well just go back into the world. At least you were having some fun in the world. That's fun. Sleeping with somebody you don't know, that's fun. Waking up the next morning next to a stranger. Going out and getting drunk and high and partying and showing off your body. And that's fun. Is it? It's fun if you don't know Jesus, but when you know Jesus... And there are people praying for you when you're backsliding. When you're backslid, it may be fun for a season, but then you come to yourself. Amen. Like the prodigal son. It's better that I eat the husk of the pigs than, you know, better that I go home and.
be a hired servant for my father than eat with the pigs. He comes to kill you. Understand what I'm telling you today. Relationships that are not of God will kill you. You get into relationships with unsaved people, they will kill you. I've seen it over and over in my 33 years of, of being with Christ. People that are so proud that say, I'm going to win them to Jesus. And you know what? They end up winning them back into the world. I was at Zion to, to go see Priscilla in her play. She's so cute, you know. She wouldn't tell me what her pot was. You know, she says, I'm going to be singing. Until I got there and found out that she was one of the temple prostitutes. She played in the play Hosea. But can I tell you, she looked like a poor Ma Tia Maria. <laughs> she looked so out of place. And then she came out with these feety pajamas. I don't know if there was ducks on them or whatever there was on them, but they, she looked so out of place, but she tried so hard. But can I tell you something? As a Christian, when you go into some of the places you shouldn't go or befriend some of the friends you should, shouldn't befriend, you're out of place. You just don't fit. And if you are comfortable fitting, something is wrong. Because ultimately, we go in with good intentions. That's why you should never enter a marriage contract ever, ever, ever without the person being saved. Well, I'll win them after. No, you won't. That's why I respect Debbie. She's told me time and time, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this, that as much as she's, she would love to have a relationship with this person in her life, that if that person was to never be saved, she would go without because she knows what it would mean as much as it would hurt, as much pain and sorrow she would go through in that process, she knows the end result of that. He comes to kill. If you can get this in your heart and in your spirit, that you have an enemy 24-7 who never relinquishes, he never gives up, he's after you all the time, and he's after me all the time. And he wants to destroy you. He wants to get you to the place where you will turn your, your heart and your, and your life away from Christ. And destroy you in the end. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He'll destroy everything. When you stand before God, what will you say? Well, Lord, you know what? I mastered the game of pool. I practice seven hours a day, seven days a week. And I can get six balls in at a time. And I'm the best pool player. I have 1,700 trophies. I've won several hundreds of thousands of dollars. You think God's going to go, hey, that's pretty cool. Bet you can't beat me. No. He doesn't care about those things. He'll ask you one question. How many souls did you reach for me? Or is your light being placed under a bed? Is it being snuffed and hidden? Are you letting your light so shine before men they would see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven? Are you ashamed of him? He'll be ashamed of you. See, because we don't think this way. You have an enemy 
And I'm telling you, you should get mad. Kick over a chair, do something. Get angry. That there is a devil who is robbing from you eternal life. He's, he's stealing, he's killing you, he's destroying you. And you know what the sad part about it is? Is that we're going right along just like Goofy. Oh, <laughs> yep. And we're just walking down the road. <laughs> and the devil's laughing at you. Because he's got you so confused in your religiosity. And your philosophies. And your ideologies. And your ideas. And what you think. And your thoughts. And your opinions. Are the God that you serve. Uh oh. See, people don't like to sit with me on a conversation one to one and talk with me about eternal things. Because I'll challenge them and I ask them, where did your belief system come from? One thing that, that used to irk Leisha when she'd ask me something is I'd always ask her a question. She said, Will you stop doing that? Because then it gets me thinking that I know what the answer is. But it's the truth. That's what Jesus did. They asked him a question, he asked them a question back. Why? Because the answer can be found if we're honest. So we have the mission of the devil, who is a thief, who comes to steal and to kill and destroy your life. He'll get you so caught up in all kinds of things. You can name some of the things in your own life that you know what I'm talking about. How he gets you so caught up in all different things and running around here and running around there and doing this and doing that. Looking and envying at other people, even unsaved people. Gee, I wish I had that. Gee, I wish I had a I wish I had a relationship. Gee, I wish I had some of that. Hello. Maybe sometimes God hasn't given us relationships because he wants to make sure there's no idols in your heart. So that when you get the right one. Hello? He said, I will have no other God before me. I am a jealous God. Hello? He's a jealous God. He doesn't want anything or anyone before him. So we have one, the mission. The first mission is the thief comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. Now we have a second mission. Jesus said, I am come. There was a divine purpose and a divine plan for the coming of Jesus into your life. He didn't just come just to save you so you could sit back now on the car of, your lo on the car of loyalty and just sit back and easy or easily ride into heaven. He says, I am come. His mission. And I hope you get this in your spirit. I hope this goes from here to here into your spirit, man. He says, I am come. That you may have life. That's not your psyche life. Your natural life. That's why you have to interpret the scripture in the proper context of what it's saying versus some of the preachers on TV that says, God wants you to be rich and prosper because he wants you to have life more life abundantly. He wants you to have everything. He wants you to have five houses, ten cars, twenty boats. That's not what that means. It includes some of that, but in the confines of God's will. 
He said, I am come. This is the words of Jesus, the one that you worship, the one that you serve, the one that you, you pray to, the one that you read about, the one you want to be like. He said, I am come that they might have life. That's the word in the Greek, zo-life. Life from above. The life of Christ living inside of you. The life that says it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ liveth in me. And then the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As the Apostle Paul did. This is a zo life. This is different. This is a higher life. This is a better life. That there's nothing in this earth, nothing on this earth that is worth forfeiting and being robbed and stolen from and destroyed of this life. And every single day I want you to know the devil is stealing that life from you. In different ways. Think about it. He says, I have come. I am personally have come to give each and every one of you, Jesus said, life from above, an eternal life, not a corrupted life, a purified life. I've come to give you this life, this eternal life. Think about it. Well, you'll have a mansion in heaven. You may not have a mansion down here, but you'll have one in heaven. You may not have gold or silver in your, in your portfolio of uh, financial stability, but you're going to be walking on streets of gold in heaven. It's going to be something you walk on. It doesn't matter that you might have the best car to drive. But you're going to be a passenger on Twinkle Airlines in the twinkling of an eye. (laughs) You're going to be the fastest transportation you ever felt in your life. So I've come that you might have life. He wants to give you life. Everything is the opposite. The devil wants to steal, kill, destroy, give you death. But he wants to bless you. God wants to bless you abundantly. Provided you do things his way. Just a testimony. You have to understand, when I came to the Lord, I came out of the nightclub business. Had a brand new car, making good money, had a good career, according to the world standards. Had all the, all the drinking, all the drugs, all the women I wanted. Because that came with being a musician. You didn't even have to be good looking, really. Just be a musician. It seems like when my generation, it was like you had all these groupies, you know, that followed the bands all over the place. When I came to Jesus, and the Lord changed my life, I left everything. You have to understand, I left my job. I sold my car, my brand new car. And I walked into the life of Christ with nothing, owning nothing. In fact, when I met my wife, she'll tell you, the only thing I brought over, because I stayed at her mom's house before we were married, the only thing I owned was what? A lunch bag. And my mom had packed me a lunch I had no job, I had no car, I had nothing. 
Remember that? I didn't stop and say, well, to be a Christian, I need to have this, 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 and this. Then, Lord, I'll serve you. No. You say, well, you're different. You, have, you were called to be a pastor. No, that, no, 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 no. I don't see that only for pastors. I see that for everybody. And I left all. And unless you have left all, don't you open your mouth against me. Hello? Don't talk about me because I drive a BMW. That not one penny of this church has ever paid for if it's anybody's business. Not one penny came out of the treasury of this church to pay for that car. I worked for it. And I'll put another candle in your cake. It's all paid for now, too. <laughs> See, but when you put God first, there are things in heaven eye hath not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered the heart of man. I don't care what you can imagine. I don't care what you could think of, of the most utopia you could think of in this world, being in the Bahamas, being in, the, in uh, Taiwan, or being somewhere where it's so, uh, so beautiful and luxurious and so many diamonds and so many furs and so, whatever it could be, whatever your thoughts are about being wealthy. The Bible says your eye has never seen, your ears have never heard, your heart has never imagined. Listen to me. The things that God has prepared for those who love him. God has prepared things for you and I to us if we love him. If we'll forsake everything for him. Do you think the devil knows that? Can I tell you this music that God has created? And sometimes we hear a song and we say, oh, that's so beautiful. Or we'll see a scenery. Oh, that's so beautiful. Your eye has not even seen the beauty. Your ears have not even heard the most sweetest music. They say in heaven, I don't know how true this is, but the scientists have researched this, that there's sound in colors. And when God made the rainbow, there was such a symphony of orchestration that just blended in with all the angels' worship of who God was. And Jesus said, I have come that you might have life, the Zoe life from heaven, the eternal life from heaven, what life is really all about. It's not about here on earth. It's not about how much you accumulate. It's not about how, how or what you become. He said, I've given you life. Now watch the second part of this. And that they might have it. Have what? What life? Natural life, the psyche life, or the zo life? The zo life. That you may have it more abundantly. Well, how does that fit in? That's spiritual good, but what about the natural? Yeah, God says that too. Jesus said these words, seek ye first, first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Kingdom of God first and his righteousness. And then all these other things shall be what? As you have need. Here's where the church has missed it. You can have your best life now. I won't mention the author. Some people get mad. Your best life now. If you think this is your best life now, Wait till you can't make that payment on your house or your car and they come and get it. 
Wait till they drain every single penny out of your pocket. Wait till you lose your job and your business goes down the tubes. Hello? Is that your best life now? Is that all you got to look forward to? Then eat, drink, and be merry, my friend. Because you've got a great awakening coming. He said that you may have it more abundantly. You may have it more abundantly. He's giving you life. Do you understand that? Do you have the concept of that? Really? Really do you have the concept of that, Brother Bob? You're shaking your head yes. So I'm, I'm picking on you. Do you really have that concept that he's given you life when you deserve death? Well, I don't, I don't deserve death. Yes, you do. The wages of sin is death. Amen. But the gift of God is eternal Zoe, eternal life through Jesus Christ. We've got our focus on this life because that's all we can see. But Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. I'm not looking to build a kingdom down here. Jesus is coming back soon. Amen. You know, it's funny because <clears throat> one day I was reading the Bible and a commercial came on television, you know, Rosalind Gold, Rosalind Capital, Rosalind Gold Capital, whatever it is called, and you know, buy gold, buy gold and silver for the dollar, the inflation of the dollars going down. And, you know, buy gold and serve up gold. And all of a sudden I turned the page to the Bible and I read, their gold and their silver shall not deliver them in the day of wrath. So everybody's thinking, well, I'm going to buy gold. I'm going to buy silver. I'm going to have money. You're not going to have any money. Guess what? Your silver and gold won't be able to deliver you. Because guess what? You will not have access to your silver and gold unless you take the mark. Oops. Gee whiz, sorry. Eh. He's given you abundant life. What are you doing with it? Hello, what are you doing with that abundant life? Are you trampling it under your feet? Am I trampling it under my feet? Something has to change. Our perspective has to change. Our thinking has to change. He has given us so much. Think about it. He could have stayed up in heaven. He could have stayed existing as the word with God. He didn't have to come down and be humiliated and rejected and beaten and ridiculed and mocked. He didn't do that for himself. He did that for you. He did it for me. Yet, we can't do anything for Jesus. If we come to church once a week, that's enough. Don't, don't be a fanatic. Hello? Because we know what? The devil has stolen this one thing from many people. And how he's stolen it and the, and the avenue that he's stolen is through this. Religion. I'm religious. I go to church on Sunday. Really? If you go to McDonald's, does that make you a hamburger? Hello? There's a thief in the house. Can I tell you there's even a thief here this morning? He's got your mind not even on the message. He's got your mind on other things. Things you've got to do, places you've got to go, laundry, sick person at home. Hello? Food in the oven. 
boyfriend, girlfriend, where are you going to go to eat after church? Hello? Taking my nap? Hello? Taking your mind away from the things that really matter the most. Giving you life. Do you realize that? I mean, am I an oddball? Am I the only one that sits down and says to God, do you know, I'd probably be in hell right now if it wasn't for you. The kind of life I was living and what I was doing. I'd probably be dead. Ever stop to just Say to God, you know, if it wasn't for you, where would I be? Think about where you were five, ten years ago. Think about what you were doing. Probably some of you had pants on the ground, pants on the ground, pants on the ground. Looked like a fool with your pants on the ground. Hat sideways, hat sideways. But think about it. All it would have taken was one accident. Some of you have been in accidents and you almost lost your life. And you walked away from the accident going, Phew, wow. But what if that accident would have taken you? Where would your eternity be? Where would it be? Or if it was that last drunken stupor you were on, And you walked out into the street and a truck hit you and killed you. Where would your soul be? Or just that one more time to go out and have a good time and you end up sleeping with somebody and then two months down the road you find out that you have AIDS and you're dying of AIDS now. Because you did one thing. Hello? Do you understand how much God has protected you? Think about it. How many ever heard of Cheech and Chong? Some of you older folk, you remember Cheech and Chong. If you don't know about it, Google them on Google. You'll find out who they are. I mean, that guy was wasted. Look at, look at uh, uh, what's that guy, Simmons? Gene Simmons. You ever hear him talk? Huh? Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah, that's who I'm thinking of. Yeah, Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah, that's who it was. I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I apologize, Gene Simmons, wherever you are. Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah, yeah. Drugs. What's your testimony? Debbie used to get high every day, right? Every single day. It's a matter that it's just a wonder that her brain is not fried. How come her brain's not fried? Every day. All day. Smoking weed all day, every day for how many years? Tell me. Over 20 years. Every single day. And you see her in her right mind. And you see her sitting here intelligent. Able to make decisions and rationalize things and think about things. Know why? Because he gave you Zolite. More abundant. He takes all the disorder and chaos and changes it and turns it around for good. Hallelujah. And we start to see God restoring, God rebuilding everything that he does. Why? Because he's given you this life. And if you have this life as a Christian, stop complaining. 
Stop moaning and groaning. He's given you life. Think about it. You, are, you were already sentenced. You had already stood before the judge. You were already found guilty. You are on your way to hell. Eternal separation from God for eternity. And Jesus stepped in and gave you life. He gave you pardon. He gave you life. And he did this not because he needed it himself. He did this for you. He did it for me. Abundantly. 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 And when you die and go to heaven, you're not going to say to God, you never gave me anything. He said, I gave you life more abundant. More abundant, I gave it to you. This abundance, in the, this word abundantly in the Greek, means, you know like you, if you go to a restaurant and you have a Coke and then you can supersize it? It's huge. You ever see them? He said that he gave you life and that you give it more abundantly. There's abundant life, but then there's more abundant. He gave you this life more abundant. What do you have need of? Peace? You have it. Do you need joy? You have it. What do you need? Gentleness? You have it. Kindness? You have it. Caring for others? You have it. The love of God dwelling in you. For the Bible says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. You may not be able to love a person in your natural love, but you can love them with the love of Jesus. Why? Because you have the Zolife living in you. Does it mean you'll be perfect? No. Does it mean you're going to make mistakes? Yes. But there should be that desire in your heart to allow that Zolife life to overtake you, to consume you, to motivate you, to embellish you, to do what's right. I didn't even use this. I should have. I'll have to preach it another time. But it's there are three lessons we can learn from this. Let's, I just want to give you those three lessons. Number one, the first lesson we learn from this: we are surrounded in this world with religious thieves. These characters are not confined to the material and social worlds alone, but to a great extent, they are found in the religious world. Some things more valuable than silver and gold are stolen. There are thieves of souls, consciences, wills, and life. There are thieves that will steal your conscience, steal your will, make you think and believe things, and make you believe that it's your voice and it's not your voice. It's the devil's voice masquerading as your voice. And so you think it's yourself, and you think, wow, why do I believe this? Why, why do I think this? It's not you thinking it. It's the devil putting that thought in your mind in the disguising of your voice. And it makes you think it's you. And he makes you think it's your voice. And he makes you think it's your thoughts. And it's not. The second lesson we can learn is we are greatly indebted to Christ for the revelation of the fact in the light of him who is the light of the world, the powers and the works of darkness are revealed. Are you hearing me? If we have this life in us, then the light will be in us also. The Bible says, let us walk in the light as he is in the light. What does light do? Expel darkness. Light expels things that are wrong. Sin is done in darkness, the Bible says. There are things that are done in darkness. That's why when you're doing something wrong, you pull the shades down. Turn off the lights. 
That's why bar rooms and nightclubs and dance clubs are all dark. Because things go on in that place that shouldn't go on. Hello? Right? That's what happens. Abundant life also gives light. The mission of human selfishness is manifested in its self-seeking aims, its cunning and cruel character and destructive results. Thus we are put on God and furnished with the means of defense when selfishness comes knocking at our door. If this zo life is in you, you won't be selfish. Hello? If you have this zo life in you, you won't be selfish. What's in it for me? Nothing. Your reward's in heaven. Oh, I, I, I don't want to do it. Now I want my reward now. Oh, guess what? Some people are just satisfied giving a cold cup of cold water in his name. But what if it requires more? The cup of cold water in his name is only a start. But I remember the words of David, I will not offer anything to the Lord that doesn't cost me anything. He gave you life more abundant. More abundantly. More abundantly. He's given you more abundantly than you could even ask or think. Doesn't the Bible say, say that? He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think. Amen. You know, we've all been praying for Mark to get saved, and we've been praying for him for a long time. There was a time when Debbie would come to me and say, Pastor, is it ever going to happen? It's taking so long. I don't understand. And I would encourage him and say, he's coming. Just keep holding on. Just keep holding on. He's coming. He's not here today because he has to work. But guess what? On his own free will, he's coming. And it's just a matter of time that he'll come walking down this aisle to receive Christ. And then from there, it'll be just a matter of time when I do marriage counseling. And then from there, it'll be just a matter of time before the, the, the uh, vows of exchange will be done. And then it'll be just a matter of time of a little reception that we'll go to to honor them and to be with them. And it'll be just a matter of time when he picks up Debbie and he walks through the threshold, oh, and the rapture comes. Although, it wouldn't make a difference anyway. And the third lesson we must learn, the mission of human selfishness serves as an effective background to the mission of divine love in Christ. At the back, we see the dark shadows of each thief of souls which has deluded emissaries in cunning and crafting deceits. See, but when we have the soul life, he exposes all of that. He shows us that if we'll have an eye to see and an ear to hear what God's Holy Spirit is saying. The spirit of distraction, hello, the spirit of distraction is one of his tools. He'll distract people because he doesn't want you to hear this. Your mind will be wandering off on something else. But I want, you to, I want you to understand that God has given you this life abundantly. Abundantly to do the works of God. To do what he's called you to do and be the person he's called you to be. Hello. He's got a great plan for your life. God is not a killjoy. But what... The robber, the thief does, says you're losing out. 
by not sleeping with somebody, you're losing out. You need to sleep with somebody so you can be a part of the crowd. You're missing out on this, these wonderful feelings and emotions and everything. No? You're not missing out. Why settle for a donut when you can have a seven-layer chocolate cake from Greg's? If you've never had Greg's seven-layer seven chocolate cake, you haven't lived till you have that kind of cake. Maybe we'll stop on the way back. But Christ has given you life and more abundantly. Now here's the question. What are you doing with that life? Are you taking it for granted? Are you letting it slip away? Are you being deceived by the thief who says, don't get too committed. Keep your life. Keep Jesus. You know, you can have your life and Jesus too. That's a lie. Oh, what are you talking about, Pastor? What do you mean? How, how can I have, not have my life in Jesus and, and make it into heaven? No, you can't. Jesus said, if you lose your life, you shall find it. But if you find your life, you shall lose it. What life do you want to live? Do you want to live this earthly, fleshly life in accumulation of things? Let me tell you something. I'll save you a lot of trouble. When you get my age, okay, and when you get Linda's, Linda's age and my age, you're tired of stuff. You want to get rid of stuff. We want to downsize. We want to get, get rid of stuff. Because, you know, as you get older and older, you slow down, and you can't clean as much. So just think about this. When you're 65 and 70, huh? Okay, when I'm ready to give it, you'll be the one in line. Uh, but don't wait too long. Um, but just think about your big house. When you're 65 years old, and you've got to clean every room because there's no more kids around. They're all gone. Hello? And you've got three cars, and you've got to clean them all. And you've got a garden, and you've got all these other things to do. Hello? You're going to say, forget it, pal. There's more to life than doing all this dumb stuff. You know? And I'm determined this year, I'm determined I want to bring another soul into the kingdom. And I was so excited when, when uh, Vicki shared that Wednesday night about her teacher. Teacher came to her and said, because of you, God sent you here. I'm going to start reading my Bible. 